Hi. Last time we talked about a method for thinking. We called it the rational presuppositional method, where we address more basic questions before addressing less basic questions. Today we want to talk about a conceptual map or a map for thinking. And a map is helpful when you're kind of lost. So uh, sometimes we're in conversations and it gets heated and it gets difficult. Uh, it would help us to navigate conversations if we had a map for thinking about basic questions and navigating how to get back to more basic questions. So today I want to talk about a conceptual map. This is a tool I use in my logic class. I inherited it from my professor. So the conceptual map talks about the three main areas of philosophy and gives us the terrain. So what are the uh, basic pieces in each of the main areas of philosophy? So last time we mentioned the three areas, epistemology, how do I know, metaphysics, what is real, and ethics, what ought I to do? And what is the good life? So we want to see what is the basic terrain in each of these areas. And if we can deal with these questions first, because philosophy is first, uh, it's the first discipline, it's a foundational discipline, and it's foundational in uh, our belief system. So if we can answer these questions first, these are the basic questions, then we can answer harder questions uh, related to these. All right, so what are the main what is the terrain in epistemology? All right, so epistemology, how do I know? Well, we can start by saying perhaps we can't know. Some people would say that. That's called skepticism. And I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but I'm kind of against skepticism because I want to know. So skepticism is a position that says we can't really have certainty. We can't know anything for sure. Um, there's a, a religious version of this called fideism. We've mentioned that as well. Fideism says that uh, we can't really know, but we have to just believe anyway. But notice, they both deny the possibility of knowing. Uh, so we kind of need to struggle with those and, and say, why would we think that? Right? But that's part of the terrain in uh, epistemology. Next, we could talk about empiricism. Empiricism is a position, and it's a long-standing position in epistemology that says that all of our knowledge is through the senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Now, you can see that this could become a problem for philosophy. Uh, maybe it works in science, but when we're doing philosophy, we want to know questions about uh, does God exist or not, or is there such a thing as a soul, and we can't see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it, then what happens? We can't know it? So sometimes epistemology, uh, sometimes empiricism and epistemology leads to skepticism. So we want to think critically about that assumption. Is all of our knowledge through the senses? And there are various versions of empiricism. You could look it up. Uh, I suggest you go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and enter the term empiricism. E-M-P-I-R-I-C-I-S-M, -I 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 empiricism. Uh, another method, possible way of knowing things in epistemology is called rationalism. You could look that one up too. Rationalism is a position that says that uh, we can get to the truth through reason. Now it looks nice because we're talking about reason, right? And we like reason. Except uh, it's the constructive use of reason to build systems of belief without first using reason to critically analyze the assumptions upon which that system rests. So uh, a lot of people have claimed to come to certain truths in, in uh, philosophy through reason, but their systems of truth turned out to be not so true. They didn't match reality. And that's because they didn't use reason critically at the basic level. They didn't do critical thinking. Remember critical thinking? Yeah. So we need to do that with, uh, um, with our, uh, our method for knowing things too. So I've mentioned skepticism and fideism. I've mentioned empiricism and rationalism. This is some of the terrain. And uh, another way people sometimes claim to know things is through testimony or what other people have told them. So I'm telling you stuff right now. Perhaps this is how you're, you're claiming to know things. Well, I watched a video and now I know it. Yeah, that's probably not a safe way to go. You probably want to test what you're watching. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. 
I could be wrong, right? I'm a human. So you want to think critically about what is passed on to you. We hear lots of claims every single day. So testimony uh, could also lead to skepticism. And some people could be just telling you false things. So think critically about what's being passed on to you. Now, all of these things are uh, long-standing ways of knowing in the history of philosophy, but there's a way I, I mentioned last time called rational presuppositionalism, which I think is a safer way to go uh, because we're using reason to test our basic beliefs, our basic assumptions, and we're giving arguments for our basic assumptions. So that's the method I commend to you. So perhaps you're having a conversation, the uh, topic of how we know things comes up, now you know the terrain and you can plot the kind of discussion you're having in that terrain and in that map and identify what kind of discussion you're having in epistemology. Now all of that was just about epistemology. What about metaphysics? Remember the uh, second uh, area of philosophy that asks the question, what is real? So uh, the discussion about being, remember I love being? Yes, I love being. And so being is what exists, what is, and something can exist always or not always. So this is why we talk about eternality when we do metaphysics. Is something eternal? Is there something always? We also talk about kinds of being or substance. Maybe something is material being. Matter. Matter is something that has size but is not conscious. It's not self-aware. Atoms are not self-aware. Oh, maybe you want to disagree with me. That's cool. Um, and then we can talk about another kind of substance, spirit. Spirit has no size and is conscious. So those are kind of opposites. Matter has size, spirit has no size. Uh, matter is not conscious, spirit is conscious. So metaphysics takes those two kinds of substances and combines them with always and not always, or temporal and eternal. And we're looking for what kind of being is eternal. Uh, is the eternal being material? There's a position. Uh, again, we're looking at a map. So the, the terrain in metaphysics, maybe everything is material. Um, this is called material monism. There's one thing that's eternal, and the one thing is matter. And uh, matter is forever, forever in the past, forever in the future. This is a, a popular view in philosophy. This is what the first philosophers started with, and it's a popular view in the academy today. So think critically about those assumptions. Is everything material? And how would we know that? Another position, alternative position, uh, is called the spiritual monism. Maybe there is no matter at all. Maybe everything is spirit. So material monism excludes spirit. Uh, spiritual monism excludes matter and says everything that exists is spirit consciousness. There is no matter. Matter is an illusion. Uh, this is uh, a, a view in Eastern philosophy and it's also in Western idealism. There's another word you could look up in the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Idealism. All that exists are minds and ideas. Perhaps we're an idea in the mind of God. Yeah, think critically about that one too. But it is part of the terrain. Maybe you're talking to someone who holds to spiritual monism. Now you know how to identify their position. A third position that says everything is always is called dualism. Dualism says there's two things that are eternal. Matter is eternal, extended things, and spirit is eternal, conscious things, like your soul. Is your soul eternal? Have you been going on forever? Think critically about that. What kind of knowledge would you have if you went on forever? Okay, so dualism is a popular view in the history of philosophy. It was held by Plato and uh, Aristotle. And you can think critically about that. But the positions that I've just named, um, material monism, spiritual monism, dualism, they all agree that everything that exists is always eternal. There's another position a contradictory position that says not everything is eternal. Just one thing is eternal and everything else is temporal. Or uh, whereas these positions I just mentioned say everything is eternal, that's called being and becoming. Being is always and it's just becoming something else. The alternative is creator and creation. This is called theism or deism, which say God is eternal and God created all the things that exist that are not eternal, that are temporal. Uh, deism says God creates, but he does not rule, 
and theism says God creates and he rules, he interacts in the created order. So this is the terrain in metaphysics. Once you have answered the question, what is eternal? Is it matter? Is it spirit? Is it both? Is it some spirit that's eternal and everything else is temporal? You can start to talk about human nature. What is a human? Uh, what is a human destiny? You can start filling out other pieces of uh, existence. Okay, so that's the terrain for metaphysics. All right, those are the basic positions. The third area of philosophy, if we're building, and think of it like a house, the, the ground is your epistemology, the foundation is your metaphysics, now we're going to build a house. And the house is how you live. This is your world and life view. This is uh, how you um, assess things, your values, your attitudes, your view of the good. Um, the terrain in ethics. Now, ethics is where there's a lot of um, controversy, confusion. Uh, the cultural issues of the day would fall in this category of ethics. Uh, there are three main um, positions in ethics, three main ways of answering what is the good life. There are many, many theories, but they fall into these three main categories. I should add a fourth category. It's not really a category, but it's the position that says that uh, we really can't know what the good is. The good is relative. So the good for you is the good for you, and the good for me is the good for me, but they can never be the same thing, really, because everybody's different. Um, that's, that's a position that maybe you should think about, but think deeply about it because it does seem like you're a human and I'm a human and the good for humans would be the same for both of us. But maybe, maybe you want to think about that. I think the good for you is the same as the good for me. Okay. What are the three main positions once we get beyond relativism? The first we'll call uh, teleological ethics. Teleological ethics is about the telos, the goal. And this is the good. Um, the good is what is sought as an end in itself. You seek it because it is the good, not for any other um, thing you're going to get out of it. So the good is the end in itself. Aristotle held to this kind of ethics, a teleological view. Um, it has fallen out of favor recently and probably because of the way we do metaphysics, but that's another video. Um, once we uh, see that there's the good is the end in itself, uh, and that's rejected, what are some other positions? Another way of doing ethics is called deontological ethics. Deon means duty, and the good is uh, doing your duty or doing the right thing. Uh, lots of people go this way. Kant went this way. Uh, you have a moral obligation to do the right thing. But what is the right thing? The right thing in light of what? It's hard to figure out what the right thing is if you don't know what the good is. Uh, the good as the end in itself. So it seems that uh, the right thing is a means to achieving the good. Um, but we'll talk about that again. I know I'm always taunting you about the good, right? All right, so we've talked about teleological, goal-oriented ethics, deontological, duty-oriented ethics. There's a third category called consequentialist ethics. And consequentialism is uh, looking at consequences, and it's usually pleasure or pain. Uh, we make choices based on the outcome. Is the outcome going to be pleasurable or painful? And so notice, um, it's about happiness, really. Happiness oriented. Uh, so the good is happiness. But can that be true? Can the good be happiness? Or is, the, is happiness an effect of possessing the good? See, we can ask these critical questions even while we're defining areas. So the terrain in ethics. Though there may be many theories, there are always going to fall under these. Ethics is relative, ethics is goal-oriented, ethics is duty-oriented, ethics is happiness or pleasure-oriented. And maybe I'm wrong, but if I am, think about it and let me know. All right, so today we talked about a conceptual map. And the conceptual map is for helping us to navigate difficult conversations and to think through the order of uh, philosophy, epistemology, what is the terrain? Metaphysics, what is the terrain? Ethics, what is the terrain? And if we can answer these questions, then we can go on to answer 
less basic questions like who should I vote for? Who should I marry? Uh, what should I major in? Right? So I hope these videos are helpful to you. And if so, please like, subscribe, and share.